we're pretty much right there, so I'm going to get started. I want to use all, all of my time today. So this, what we are about to get into now is uh, probably in the last 10 years has been one of the most passionate elements for me in horsemanship. What we talked about in our last info session was what does it mean to meet a horse's needs? What is relational horsemanship? What is the pillar that it's built on? And I've been so happy to be able to spend time with many of you at the booth and share what, what that means to me. Uh, it's pretty important that I'm able to represent that well because I, I want you to really get the ideas. All right, so, so now what we've done is we've built an understanding of relational horsemanship and I've helped you understand what it means to meet a horse's needs and how that interpretation really empowers change. So I hope that that's been clear to you, that your interpretation really matters and will set a tone to change all the answers you get from a horse, no matter what you're asking, because it changes your energy. All right, so today what we're going to go through is, this is the idea of a horse using themselves right. And for us to really grasp that, you have to recognize that the state of mind has a powerful effect on how the horse's body can be used. So this idea is how do you bring the horse's mind and body together? And that in itself is self-carriage. So I, we were talking a little bit earlier at the booth there about how, how we do that. What does that look like? The mind is deeply connected to a horse's state, of body, a state, state within their bodies. All right? So if a horse is not in the correct mind frame, what does that do in their body? Okay, what happens in a horse's body when they're in an anxious state? Tension, very good. That's predominantly what you're going to see. Now, the key is, where does this tension happen? Where does the tension happen and what effect does that have on their body? And does that make it easier for them to use themselves or more difficult? We're going to discuss that in, in depth. And I also want to talk about where does self-carriage happen? Because by understanding that, you will begin to understand the difference between what maybe collection actually is. Because we have a vision of what that means to us in our minds. But the key is, and this has been my journey, is what is it to a horse? What is it to a horse? What does it look like when a horse uses themselves? When they're athletically balanced, what are they doing and why? And I hope to share that with you today. All right. So a horse's state of mind affects their body function. We kind of have that in our minds. So in general, a negative mindset creates tension in the body. And this generally comes because of a lack of relational connection. You're not meeting the horse's needs. So generally they're in a tight state because they're a little bit worried that they need to take care of themselves. This in itself, if any of you are trying to get your horses to shape up, trying to get them to use themselves right, if their needs are not met, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do. You might have some great principles, some great techniques, but they're not going to be working because the horse isn't feeling like you're taking care of what matters to them. Most of the time when we start working horses, we're very quick to say most things that a horse is doing is disobedience, and now we're butting heads about needs. The horse is now trying to take care of their own needs. This leaves a horse in a state of tension. All right, and that tension comes in their body. Now, a positive mindset, obviously the horse's body now begins to relax. This generally comes because a rider has changed their perspective on what the horse needs, and you provide that to the horse. Okay, so this is a, I like, kind of like this picture because it's not the perfect picture because, you know, the mare's not really moving and we had to help her to make a change and I don't really like to pull on a horse. But what it demonstrates is the picture of two different horses in two different forms. All right, so this little mare I'm riding is, is quite well schooled. She understands how to use her body and if you can see, there's very little connection in my rein. There's a feel there but she understands how to use her body. When I'm talking about how a horse carries themselves, I speak often of the ideas of self-carriage. And we must think of the difference between self-carriage and frame. A frame is something you can induce by pressure. You make it happen. So if there's weight or tension or pressure in your seat and legs or holding in your hands, this is a frame because the horse is not developing that in their ownness. Okay, we're making it. And, it, and so then there's not a, a balance in it. Well, it is a dependent balance upon your presence. We're not empowering the body of the horse. 
So in this picture, we can see this is a colt. We were just getting her started. I start a lot of horses this way because the horse can be comforted by the other horse and you can support them. But in this picture, we see a, a mare that, that is tensing her top line. She's a bit unsure, okay? We needed to help her make a bunch of changes, but you also see a horse right beside her with all the opposite muscles activating. Okay, and so you can really see the ranginess. That's what I love about this picture. The ranginess of a horse that's inverted and a horse that's actually relaxing their back. Okay, you can also see where my mare's head position is. It's actually almost the highest point of her balance. Okay, everything rises to the head. And what that means is she has an understanding of how to use her hindquarters because the hindquarters holds everything up. We're going to get into that more. Don't want to try to take too much away. But recognize the back can go through massive extremes. And when we think of the back and we think of collection and carriage, we're talking from the tail to the ears. It's absolutely imperative that you speak to the whole horse. A lot of times what I find is people actually get caught thinking the neck has something to do with collection, something to do with carriage. And this is actually quite a facade when you start understanding the physiology of how a horse was made. When we carry ourselves, if we all think of back to sports, okay, when, what was it that we had to get centered? We need to get our hips under our body and we need to be able to get under ourselves. And horses are the same, they just happen to be on four legs. So the more we're able to help them understand how to activate from behind, this changes their posture. So again, in the picture on the left, this little mare is thinking about the aids from her head and neck. And Hannah, the mare I'm sitting on, is thinking about this from her whole body. Okay, so she is carrying herself in a, in a posture. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so this is a very important detail. And um, I find that people kind of struggle with this sometimes. Most of us often think that the top line or the, the neck of a horse actually goes along the top of their, of their crest. Okay, so we kind of envision that it would make sense that that would be the case because it's the same for us. We see that our, our, our spine, our neck, excuse me, our spine is just under the surface. But for a horse, it's actually quite different. And in general, most horses we would say are slightly downhill. So the point of at the sacrum or the highest point in the hindquarters, we kind of put a line, okay, or a dot. And then you take that point and you go to the base of the neck. And that's gonna give you a quick sense of actually how difficult it is for the conformation of your horse to actually activate to engagement. So we have piles of different breeds, okay? We have some breeds where it's super easy. Hopefully you guys will join me as I demonstrate on my Andalusian this afternoon. Okay, you guys have seen the progression of some of my horses. We've gone through a pretty downhill quarter horse, my big guy but he needs to still use his back and work his legs, but it's not gonna look massively impressive, okay? Because he has to work pretty hard to carry himself. The quarter horses are not necessarily built for engagement or activation. I know that sounds crazy. You take other breeds, well, they're actually built almost uphill anyways, so they can sit almost immediately. There are certain people that would say that the quarter horses aren't necessarily even riding horses. And it's kind of like, holy, really? <laughs> Just because of the way they're built. All right, so this is just the basis. Now, so I just want you to understand two parts here. First of all, the degree of difficulty it is for a horse to activate themselves is dictated by the degree of downhillness that line is. Does that make sense? So the horse has to raise up and they have to be able to get under. The more downhill you get, and you can just look at a horse from the side picture and you'll see that. Now the second piece you have to understand is that the scapula is not connected by a collarbone. So you see we have a collarbone right here. And what that means is it kind of stabilizes our shoulders to our spine. Horses do not have that. The chasm of their ribs, their spine, and their body is actually separate from their scapula, okay? So what that means is it floats. Now what does that mean? Muscularly, there is a lot of power to shift a horse from, is it very close? Can I go back? Oh, yes. A horse has a great ability to take this tension and drop things down or that relaxation and raise things up, okay? It's very important now. So the details of how we do things really start to matter because if there's tension in that top line, it's having a massive effect on what starts to create, this can actually drop or it can raise. There's mobility there. We have almost no mobility because of our collarbone. What often breaks when we hit our shoulders? It's our collarbone. 
okay? But horses flex and they move and they have huge range. Is that clear? So those two points are really important. All right, now we get into the musculature of this. So now we understand this is a floating mechanism, okay? It's floating. Nothing's holding it there but muscles and tendons, okay? So, so we recognize now that there are some muscles. This is about as anatomical as I'm going to get, okay? Because I think these groups really start to matter. We recognize that there are some big muscles on the top line and the, the underlying muscles are actually quite a bit smaller. And this is a beautiful design because it connects directly to relational horsemanship. I love this. If a horse is in an actively negative state, which muscles are going to fire? The ones on the top line, those big guys. Because what a horse thinks first, save myself first. Okay? So if they're anxious, those big muscles work. Okay, now remember, they don't have a collarbone. So when those muscles fire, where does that push the horse's column? Does it lift it up more? Does it drive it down? Drives it down. Where does that put their weight? Onto their forehand. So a horse that is in a negative mind state, firing negative muscles, immediately becomes forehanded. So you must meet a relational need to shut the big muscles off to even begin schooling. So you must take the time to meet your horse's need. Can you, can you see the case I'm building for that? And I think that's beautiful. You don't get the horse's body until you meet the needs. That seems pretty relational. Okay, that seems pretty cool to me. So I call the top line the defensive muscles. The muscles along the top line are the defensive muscles. They fire when the horse is worried. And that immediately caves the horse out, and they're less usable. The underlying muscle, this is, there's, there's kind of a couple really important pieces, and I'm not necessarily going to get into the, the specific details because there's a lot of ground to cover here. But we understand that the underlying muscles are going to be the muscles that can contract. They are smaller than the top line muscles, so they can only fire if the defensive muscles are off. This is a meeting relational needs. Then we can train the horse to activate the underlying muscles, which allow them to raise the base of their neck. All right? So the things for carriage, there's three main points to carriage, and all these things have to work together, not separately. Okay? We have to be able to activate the longus coli. This is the muscle under the spine. We talked in there why I use the cavicin so much, that we have to rotate the pole, and that activates the hindquarters. If things don't happen in a certain physiological order, the system doesn't work right. Okay? So first of all, we release the top line. We, that lets those muscles go. We activate the underline, and then we can start speaking to more of our horses. All right, so you guys saw Bentley. This is him uh, happily overeating. Um, this picture's a bit compressed. <laughs> um, but in a resting state, okay? He's in a resting state. So you can see the spine. You can, if you can just envision now where the spine is, it goes down, and then it goes up. You can see the thick column of the neck, all right? It goes down and then up. These little quarter horses, they're pretty down. You know, we built their, what was the quarter horse actually built for? Quarter horse, quarter mile. Yeah, they're running horses. That's where it kind of bred out of. And then we've ranged that into branch horses because they've got these quiet minds and we've promoted that. All right. This is resting in action. It's a beautiful picture for me because it's just, you see, he's just moving. There's no influence of the hand and he's just moving. So the top line is off. And you see a couple things. This is a big detail for me. By allowing the head and neck to get out of the way, what does this allow the hindquarters to do? The hindquarters can freely move. This is a bit of a challenging conception for a lot of people because a lot of times we have believed that collection comes when we do what? Yeah, we bring the head in. There's a sense that by bringing the head in, we get the, a horse to become collected. Really what starts to happen is we're actually creating a look, but that doesn't mean anything's activating behind. All right, so by working a horse in a, in a physiological manner, because I'm really trying to study the horses, not necessarily just focus on an opinion, you move the bones and muscles in certain ways and they have certain motions. You move them in different ways, they have certain motions, okay? So we want to get to a place where we can keep the back off. We can ride in a certain way. I'm slightly forward off his back, but I'm just trying to let him move freely. I'm trying to find his center point. This is always what we should do. So that his back can stay off, his hindquarters can move freely. You can see he is, he is, his inside, his left hind is not even touching the ground yet. So this is pretty good. He's swinging pretty good there. I'm pretty pleased with that. Okay, now this is a really fun picture because it really starts to demonstrate the muscular activity when a horse is in a bit of a negative state. All right, so the red is starting to talk about where things are over firing. 
So now we start talking about what is it that we actually see when a horse is using themselves right. Okay, so in that previous picture, we saw that, that Max, he's the horse I used in the first demo, is freely able to, to get the balance, the back is off, and the hind legs are really rangy. They're really moving forward well. <clears throat> if you can envision what happens when these muscles fire. All right, so now we've already talked that the base of the neck drops. The head pops up. See, your head pops up not just by raising the head. It actually pops up by the contraction like this. So it goes like this. They drop and the head raises. That's the contraction of that muscle group. It also fires the long muscles in the back, but it also goes along the hindquarters. And when those muscles fire in the back end, what does that ask the hind legs to do? Are they going to go under easy or are they going to actually get pulled backwards? They're going to get pulled backwards and now we start understanding why a horse would actually not be able to step through themselves. So this actually makes a horse not want to track up. And is this something we try to do with our horses? Yeah, we're trying to get them to get under themselves and use themselves. But if their back is consistently firing, it's actually impossible. So what do we find ourselves doing in our principles? We actually start arguing with our horses about asking them to do something that they physically can't do. Okay, so this really becomes important that we start changing a little bit of the perspective of how we're looking at what it means for a horse to carry themselves. Is that clear? Okay. All right, so, so the, this is a bit of a, bitter, a better picture to define this. We use this, we can see the force, the tension is coming down through that, that spot where that yellow arrow is, and that actually forces the spine forward and down. Okay, now add impulsion to that. You see what we're starting to create. Now what happens is you're going to feel a whole bunch of horse in your hands. Okay, and then we start thinking about asking a horse to frame up. You see we're a little backwards. We're kind of starting at the wrong point. And this is where I find there comes a lot of confusion in my style. There should not be weight in your reins. If there's heaviness in your hands, to the degree, and this is math again, we just think of force and load. If there's weight in your reins, that weight comes from somewhere. When you take a horse's neck and you elongate it that much and you take a 25 pound weight and you put it down and then you lean into it to put weight, where is the weight going? It just naturally goes to the forehand. So we have to reverse the process, release what's going on, and take a step back. And that's really where we talk about the progressions of carriage when we're talking about the shoulders, the pole, and the hindquarters. Okay. All right. Oh, look at this. I needed to actually be clicking my button. So a lack of relational connection equals... Very good, Josh. This is great. Fear, confusion, and imbalance. And I'll bet you that equals... Yes, there's the next button. Good. It equals brace. All right. So a lack of connection, a lack of relational connection equals fear and confusion. Anytime your horse is, fear, is fearful, confused, or imbalanced, you're getting forehandedness and you're getting top line tension. So now we're not in a place. When that's happening, guys, stop asking your horses to carry themselves. Stop it. Full halt. Meet the needs. Start again. Remember, your horses, if they stop thinking, if they're worried, all you're doing is promoting tension. Okay, you can't dominate a horse into carrying themselves. It's impossible. To get a horse to use their body right, they have to trust you. You have to have built a relationship so they will turn off their defensive muscles. They cannot physically use their bodies when they're in a defensive state. To me, that's a beautiful thing. It means you get them when you earn them. It's cool. I think that's cool, as, as any good relationship should, right? But again, we've got to change our perspective. That's why I didn't talk about this. This lecture is not first. Relational horsemanship lesson is first. You have to understand you've got to meet the needs. You're getting my point slowly, I hope. All right, so this is a picture of a horse in a full contraction. All right, so we talk about now, okay, oh, I say defensive muscles. I should have had it so that that was the next button. So let's just say we didn't see the defensive muscles. We see this, this, those muscles firing. What is, okay, let me, tell me guys, what is the horse, what mind state are they in right now? Yeah, there, there's a negativity there, isn't there? We all know what happens when our horses get up like that. Ooh, they're anxious, okay? Again, if a horse is anxious in mind and now you take a hold of your reins, are you compounding or are you making the problem better? We start compounding because now they're already anxious about something and now we're taking a hold of them and now, holy smokes, the ball starts to roll. So your horse is relationally anxious and now physically active. This is a problem. Remember, your horse has a very small cerebral cortex. The processor is small. If they tip into fear, you're already done. They're not learning. They're not learning anymore. So it's really important that we recognize all of these pieces, that the system, the mind and the system are actually very interconnected. All right, so again, where does that put the spine? Yeah, it starts to drop. Holy smokes, look at that pretty picture. So, what's happening here? Nice spooking, okay? I'm gonna share with you guys all of it. Does, this, does that happen to us? Yeah, sure it does. Should I show you only pretty pictures? 
well, if I only want you to think only perfect of me. That's not the case. We're all in this world together. This horse is spooking. I'm doing my best to sit still, a little bit tight. He kind of hit my hands. He's pushing on the reins. What does that make his back do? It's going to tighten even more. Okay. So when anxiety is in motion, you have tension in the back. All right. The back inverts. Now we have a little better sense of what's actually physically happening when your back is inverting. I hope you can actually see just a little bit of what's actually happening under your horse when the back inverts. The spine drops. Boof. It's way low now. Because again, why can that spine drop? They don't have collarbones, right? The mass of the horse and the rider puts excessive weight on the horse's front end. Holy smokes, we forgot to think about us. Where are we situated? Well, maybe in the fetal position. You're right. Yeah, that's, that's not always easy to sit, is it? All right. So the, if you just think about this now, from the horse's hindquarters, we're quite a ways up there. So then all of that stuff happens. Well, now our weight encourages more. And in the end, where is this going to put our weight? It's going to put the weight on the forehand, and it's going to load those reins up with weight, right? So now, again, we put these situations where if we take a hold of reins, man, you give a horse something really strong to fall against. And obviously, now there's a loss of engagement. And would we say that's proper use? Or maybe, maybe probably no. You know, his front end is up a little bit. His hindquarters is down. Someone might build a case there. This horse is not happy. He's scared, OK? There's a situation where he's spooked. All right. So now we just take this and we look at this in a little bit more of an active state. I would like to, at some point, get some pictures of the actual spine and kind of make it like this. But most of the pictures that I have are skeletons of this. You know, this is from Wikipedia. This is the cleanest picture that you can, I've been able to see just of that line. So the spine is, is in its normal state. And then I just put the line, the blue line, is kind of like what happens when the horse becomes more anxious, right? So what happens is muscles are firing. And the back is firing, the loins are firing in a negative way. And we still kind of want to get our horses to frame up. We still like them to start doing this, all right? So what ends up happening is this. And we see this a lot. And this is because we have a little bit of a slanted view in my vision of what collection is. What is this horse doing? OK. Yeah, OK. And why, why, can, how, why and how can a horse duck behind? What is it that allows them to do this? that they can give their neck and give nothing else. OK, shoulders can have a part of it for sure. The spinous process, the spine, has mobility. All right. So envision how hard is it for a horse to activate their body and sit, to actually use their loins. Do you think that's easier or harder than just bending the neck? OK, it's quite a bit easier for a horse just to bend their neck. Very straightforward. It's very easy for me to do this. It's different for me to do this. OK, now is it better for me? to do this? Of course it is, because I'm going to have better posture. But in this situation, he is giving to the rein. Okay, and this is again where the misconception comes. There is slack in that rein. Okay, but what we see is he is very short behind. Look at how high his hip is. The angulation is very much so backwards from the point of his hip. Can you see that, guys? Now I understand it's in his back, it's in his retracted line. He's not stepping forward. But you're going to see here, oh, maybe I have to, oh, again take these. So you take away, okay, so let's talk about overflection. So I'm going to prioritize this a moment. Where does the horse look? What kind of question is that? Out their eyes? Okay, yes. Okay, mostly horses are looking down their nose. Okay, they, they see when a horse gets worried, where do they, where do they kind of, or when they're alert to something, do they, yeah, they, they go like this. It's like they're looking up and down their nose a bit. All right, so, so when you start to overflex a horse, we're going to start understanding what overflexion is. Overflexion takes away the horse's senses. They now can't see. So then are we now prioritizing submission or are we prioritizing carriage? If you take away the horse's senses, you're prioritizing a submissiveness. Okay. Now I'm not going to say, I'm not here to have an opinion about this. I am going to guarantee you there are moments when asking your horse to be submissive is very valuable to your health. Okay. Don't undermine this concept, but any concept can be much overdone. Okay, so there's a pro and a con to everything. You must always glean pros. Don't dump the baby out with the bathwater. There are moments when having your horse submit a bit and wait is very valuable to you. But submissiveness and collection should have no connection. You see where I'm going now. So we have a horse that is, can overgive, that is giving predominantly their neck, is not coming through. This is a more submissive moment 
not a carried moment. All right, now we're going to see this from a different perspective. Oh, I got to go through my pieces here. I, I probably shouldn't have talking points. I should just have pictures, really, hey? So this is more submissive. There you go. I'm glad that my work, my talking is agreeing with my slides. That's helpful. Hyperflexion leads. Okay, and this is the next piece. So I get a lot of times we talk, horses come to me and they're, they're kind of fatigued. They're sore. They're muscle sore. Okay, soreness comes because something's overgiving and something's giving too much. Now you have the body working out of balance. All right, so horses can become sore and uh, tight because of this. Um, and they become disconnected from the front end to the back. How is that possible? Again, the, the neck gives lots, but the top line, his back is actually not giving. Okay, and sometimes we say, I can't really see that. So, okay, well, um, you're going to see that in a slide coming up. Criteria for creating a positive mind state. So this is just a summary. The rider leadership, uh, rider leadership presents and earns horses' trust. Horses' needs are met. Peace, clarity, and understanding. Okay, that's what I'm trying to produce right now. Peace, leadership. Clarity, I'm trying to teach you. Understanding is allowed, how you're able to actually formulate that. And it can start to produce muscle relaxation. And this allows the pole and the hindquarters to activate together. Okay, why does, I said this to everybody, I believe that the cavison is, is one of the most important groundwork tools you can have in your barn. Again, start thinking about that. We start understanding the rotation of the pole and less bending of the neck activates the hindquarters. So we need to start feeling the hindquarters step under. I'm going to show you today with Mind Illusion how that starts to show through bend and long, longitudinal engagement so you can see how he moves. Okay, um, I hope that I can demonstrate that in a clear way. And this is really what we're trying to do. So one of the problems with an overly submissive neck is it disconnects what? It disconnects the pole from the hindquarters. If you can envision this, you start to create rotation in the pole, and now the neck starts to bend. So what you do is you get horses that are falling out of where? They're falling off their shoulders all the time. Shoulders leaning in, shoulders leaning out constantly, perpetual shoulders. Now, one of the challenges is the shoulders are falling side to side, but the spine has also dropped. So now you have a horse on their forehand and falling out their shoulders, but they have a bent neck. So it seems to appear like a collection. You understand? When our horses are carrying themselves, they will activate their hindquarters. So whatever change you're making. So sometimes people will say, well, I don't agree with you, or what, and that's fine. But what I, so always ask yourself, is what you're doing up front activating the hindquarters? That's all I care about. Okay, there's many, many ways to possibly try to achieve that, but is it activating the hindquarters to sit more. Okay, well, what does that look like? Can we see the differences? So now, we got defensive lines off, defensive muscles off. What turns the defensive muscles off? Relaxation, so we summarize that as a relational approach to meeting your horse's needs, okay? That turns the muscles off. Now, understanding of physiology, balances shoulders, activates the pole, activates the hindquarters. Now what muscles fire? The underlying muscles. These what I call the relational muscles. These are the muscles that actually allow a horse to develop. You can't even talk to those until the top line's off. And if you try, you have to force things. It's just very, very natural, pro naturally progressive. So the with the relational muscles on, the longest coli fires. This actually raises the base of the neck, and the horse can step underneath themselves. Remember the picture of Max when his top line was off. I was riding him bridleless. Top line's off. His Head is in a high posture, his back is relaxed, but his hindquarters are really traveling. If you want to tell, this is again a little thing, if you want to tell how engaged a horse is, to me it has more to do with how deeply their hindquarters are traveling, not how round their neck is. Okay, this is a very classical perspective. This is old work. This is not, I'm not just coming up with this. But we have tended, tended to get to a belief that the neck has something to do with this. So I'm just trying to create a bit of historical clarity. Aha, now we can see. This is the picture I've been waiting for. Okay, so now we get to talk about a little bit about the difference between frame over flexion and what I would say as self-carriage. Some people would look at the top picture and you would see this as a certain thing. And for me, the top picture is demonstrating a lot more of what I call self-carriage. People would look at that and say, that's collection. Maybe it is. Collection to me is just muscles built around something. So when you look at the tree of training, collection's kind of the top kind of hierarchical perspective. And really all that means is you've put a bunch of muscle around a self-carriage. 
Okay, so you learn why in any sport we have a ready position and then you work, 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 and you get muscle to sustain that. So that's really what I think of, of collection. So I would say he's in a collected state, but I'm working towards self-carriage. Okay, now, can you see now the differences in the hindquarters? Can you see the differences in what the stride is doing? Look at the difference in the joints in the back leg. Look at the head position. Look at the amount of neck flexing. Now we're starting to understand the difference between activating a horse and asking them to come under. And when a horse comes under, what do they then try to do with their neck? The, the head has to actually elevate. Okay? From a submissive perspective, we're going to ask that head to come down. We're going to overbend the neck. That's a submissive thing. Again, not discounting that. There are moments we need that. But if we're speaking towards self-carriage, we have to allow the horse's head to elevate to their own natural posture. Okay, you guys haven't met Cruz yet? Or, oh yeah, you did. Yesterday I showed him a little bit. Uh, oh, Friday. My Aunt Illusion, you saw him. Is his head posture going to naturally be different than Max? <laughs> my Maximus, Maximus I call him, he's my man. He was tired on Friday. And I talked to a couple people and you know, he was, he was really low. His head posture was really low. And normally if you watch some of the video at my booth there, you can see that, you know, in those pictures he's a little higher. He was pretty tired. It's a big trip getting here. You know, it's like there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, and so he was a little lower than he normally would. But mostly the pole, when a horse is actually using themselves, the pole will be slightly above the withers. What this does is it creates a natural angulation for the hindquarters to activate. Okay, we're just again trying to talk about the physics. Okay, so hopefully you can see the difference. When a horse is really using their hind legs, there's real activity in the three joints of the back leg. There's lots of activity there. The horse is really going to activate and they're going to sit and they're going to be ready to kind of pick themselves up. When you see a horse who's actually, so now you can see the difference. You see how his hindquarters is quite a bit lower in this picture? You see his front end is quite a bit higher and you could almost envision on him. This is a, a Morgan gelding that I had the privilege of working and we wanted to talk through a lot of these progressions. I didn't make him spook on purpose, but you can sure see the range. It just happened and it was really valuable. But here we're, we're kind of, because he was so soft, he'll, he'll overflex if you ask him to. But then if you ride him different, he'll start using himself better. Okay, so, so see the differences. How high his croup is there and how low it is on the other side. See the activation of the hind legs. See that he's rising up from the back all the way to the front. Again, here what he's doing is he is overflexing his neck and nothing has changed behind. And this is truly the point of this. A horse can be light in the hands, overflexing their neck, and not be doing anything behind. So you're going to get short little steps, and they're still going to be falling forward into your hands. Does this make sense? Again, I just want to educate regarding the perspectives of the physiology of a horse. And again, a very classical approach would help us see that, sub, or excuse me, a classical approach would help us understand how that takes us upright. Submissive approaches will always take us down. Okay, so let's take this just one step and soften that. Is it valuable for a horse to lower their head? Did you guys see my demo yesterday? Yeah, did I ask that mare to, to soften and lower her head? What effect does that have? Uh, relaxation, very good. What effect does that have on the muscles? Did that relax her back? Did we see her move more calmly? We sure, we sure did, well I sure did, I hope you saw that too. So is it valuable for horses to drop their head? Sure it is, okay? So we need to know the pros and cons of each thing we're doing and try not to get caught up in overdoing one element at the, at the, what's the word? Expense, thank you very much, of something else positive. Okay, so this is really where the point hammers home, okay? As we begin to educate ourselves on an approach towards submissiveness, this moments is valuable. If we overdo it, this is what we get, okay? The classical school will spend huge amounts of time not submitting anything to preserve that to its fullness. The Western culture and safety of the masses discourages taking this time because what would we like? To be, well, we want submissive, very good, but the purpose of it is safety. We don't want to die. You know, we like riding and we want to ride long time, right? So we want to have the balance. So again, I just want to really, really hit that one home. Okay. So by expanding our understanding of proper body function, we can start changing how we ride a horse. And I find that body posture, I talked a little bit about that with Max uh, Bentley yesterday. I'm gonna talk about that a little more with Cruise Man. I have all these half names or weird names for my horses. They're my, my buddies. But you can notice in this picture that there is a certain posturing in my body. 
Everybody's body posture has a uniqueness. We're not all built the same. And I don't intend for everybody to look the same. What is a great rider? What is the sign of a great rider to me? The sign of a great rider is one who has the ability to get out of a horse's way to display the horse, not do lots to make the horse do something. Okay? So if we have to do lots to make our horses do something, then now your horse is not in self-carriage. This is a, de a dependency, not an independency. Independency creates self-carriage. Right. So now we start understanding what does our body need to do? Well, what you do with your seat, understanding what the hindquarters does, starts to cause you to think about using your hips different. Okay, because what you're doing with your body is going to have an effect on them. What you do with your shoulders is going to matter as well. Are your shoulders stacked over your hips? If your shoulders are not stacked over your hips, you're not disappearing. If you're tipped forward, now every movement of your body causes a direct effect on your horse. Have you ever had a little kid sit on your shoulders? Some of you remember my Saskatoon joke that I made. But this idea that, you know, my son was sitting on my shoulders picking Saskatoons. And when he was right here, it was no problem. As soon as he started to reach, I have to compensate. So I have to compensate to hold myself up. He was just little then. And then we're, you know, the weight ratio, someone will say, well, it's not much weight, but it's balance. Weight, weight, balance is the key, not weight. So if you take a little bit of your weight and you tip it off, the horse has to comp compensate. So we have a couple lines that matter. You have long lines and you have lateral lines. We talked about that a little in the demo, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more this afternoon as well. So this is, this is kind of us getting to a place where we're now starting to, I want to educate a little bit on the body function. I want to show you how relational horsemanship builds this approach to a horse using themselves right. By understanding the biology, I want you to also see what does the biology say about self-carriage. Okay, I'm trying to be as, uh, obviously this is my opinion, but I, if you can take bones, muscles, ligaments, and tendons, and you can build a defense based on them, and the relational mind, it actually starts to lessen opinion you see where I'm, where I'm trying to go? I really like that. I'm a scientist. I have been trained as a scientist. Um, so I have a scientific mind, and I do not want to bear opinion just because I think it's right. If it's wrong, I want to get better. Okay, so that's really, I'm trying to use that basis based on the physiology. Again, the classical school really holds light to that. So again, this is kind of what we're trying to do. Now, I said earlier, is Max going to look like Cruz? No, he's not. Did Bentley look like Cruz? No. So every horse should look slightly different. But in general, we should promote each one of them. Max is not going to have the same head height. That horse is big. When it comes to picking up or roping, roping or whatever I'm doing, ponying horses, that horse is awesome. There is nothing that can move him because he's built like a tank. Okay? But you take Cruz, he's built totally different. Okay? So you, you're, every, everything you add will take away somewhere else because you can't, can't have you know, the, the perfect horse, I guess, whatever. Now, Bentley is built. He's a little, he has a little bit easier time getting up and getting under. Now, that's an age thing as well, but it's also confirmation. And then Cruz is going to have a much, much more perspective like this. All right. Okay. Now, this, is, this picture sucks, and I know it, but, but it makes the point too well. One of my mentorship students put this together. This is a student that I've worked with for quite a long time. This was the beginning of, you know, when her horse was getting started. And uh, the, the picture is just to promote. Like, there's not everything perfect about this. But again, that's not the point. The point is to start generally understanding concepts. And so if you look, you see his left hind is still coming off the ground. He is still in an extended step in the top picture. So he's still reaching forward. In the bottom picture, his right hind is already on the ground. So you see that the reach when a horse's back is tight like that, the reins are a little bit tight, you can start seeing a massive difference in what a horse's body is capable of doing and how easily they can get under themselves. Okay, so again, if there's weight in your reins, the only two things a horse can do, okay, they will either do what the bottom picture is doing or they will do what Griff is doing right there. Because you can get them to give their neck, but if they're leaning forward and they give, they're still leaning. So you'll still get a horse wanting to fall. All right? Okay. So our goal, this would be our goal. And the goal for me is that I want a content horse. Uh, relational horsemanship bases this on the idea that we're trying to meet our horse's needs and not look at them emotionally not get into arguments. It's not about a horse being bad. It's about taking care of their needs. When 
the mind is taken care of. And we start to understand the physiology, we get a little bit more insight about how a horse should move, and we can balance those two. This is what unleashes the beauty. Okay, we all have it in us. All of us have horse DNA. I don't care what anybody says about DNA. I think it's in our blood. Okay, what do we think about when we wake up in the morning? Coffee, then horses. Lunch, then horses. Sometimes we don't even eat lunch because we were thinking too much about horses. All right. I inspire all of you to remember the deep love that is in your heart that inspires you to ride. Okay, why do you do this? Not because you want another dysfunctional, demanding relationship. Okay. <laughs> I know we've all got those, right? The idea is that we're trying to promote that love. I want the heartfelt desire that I have for horses to be the base of how they use themselves and how I ask them to use themselves and how I ask them to move through life. And what I'm trying to do in my approach and in my style is to, is to honor both of those systems. And I believe that this is a process that allows that to happen. Where we're not forcing, we're not making, we're not fighting. Does it take a little bit of time? Yes, it does. Am I giving you a quick fix? No, I'm not. It's not what I'm here for. I'm not trying to sell you something and say, boy, if you follow this, you're going to have results in two days. It's not true. Have any of you built a good relationship in two days? How about two weeks? Oh, no. We can have some fun moments, but it's not necessarily building those deep roots. So good principles and time. This is why it's important. You must follow good principles and time. And slowly we start to develop a base that a horse can feel safe and use their bodies right. And that's what I'm here to inspire. Okay, and my program would, uh, would encourage these, these, this progression. So I always say that you know, with a mind of quick fix, you probably won't like me much because it takes time for us all to learn, to adapt, have the space to feel safe and do that for our horses and for ourselves. All right, and hopefully in the end, doesn't matter the gear, okay? Yes, I come from a more Western culture, but I'm not gonna look and judge you either. I don't want us to judge each other. Our desire is to ride our horses and have them use themselves well. It's the reason I, I, I help everybody, because all I'm trying to do is get the horses to use themselves right. We need horses to use themselves right to go over jumps, to move like a dressage horse, to stop well, to work a cow. It is of un it's no consequence to me. And so then, that's the goal. So we can develop happy horses that are using their bodies correctly. All right? And then again, we're back to the final slide. So I am confident that I am close. Yes, all right. Okay, so I have two minutes. I have not once, through this whole thing, answered a question live. And I apologize about that, but it's partly because of my deal. Oh, right. Okay, yes. We have a draw to do. So many of you, uh, so we brought, I don't know how many ballots we bought. It was a lot, and we ran out this morning. So, um, oh, look at my helper. She knows exactly what, oh, okay. okay. We'll just wait until Taylor's ready. <laughs> This is my daughter, everyone, Taylor. <laughs> okay, does anybody have a question? Hopefully, yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, based on my uh, principles, what is the opinion of Western pleasure horses in their postures? Um, the way I look at all this stuff is that um, I look at all the different disciplines and I see it more about rules to games. So um, anything, any discipline is, is like a game and they have rules they're following. And to play in the game, you must like and abide by the rules. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm not necessarily discipline fo focused at this point and why certain people would probably like my style and others might not. And I always look at it that way because I had a struggle in certain times in my life when I thought, well, this is right and this is wrong. And I actually broke it down in a far, and I feel like a better way to say, if, if I like those rules, then that works for me. And not necessarily do all rules maybe follow the physiology of a horse, but they are the rules of, those game, of that game. So that's really the way I've looked at it. And it just allows me to kind of, you know, if people want to play those games, then that's the rule they have to play. And I don't mean games like it's a negative thing. I mean following a discipline you must then be able to enjoy those rules. So um, 
might be different than how I go about it with my horses, but I just kind of say, you know what, if, if, if people are going to go and play, well, here's your rules. And then I just show you maybe what my rules are, and it can maybe show some differences, but that's, yeah, my rules, so my game. <laughs> oh, good question, yeah. Okay, one more question before I have to go. We have to prepare for the demo. All right. Oh, oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Totally. Totally. Sure. So the question is, yeah, is in any discipline with different rules, can certain horses be using themselves right and maybe others not? And I would say, yes, there are. There are, there are ways to have a horse carry a certain position, but what it means is it means it would put a different degree of demand upon the hindquarters to hold the head in a certain position, but yet still hold themselves under. So it would take a greater degree of development of certain muscles to retain those things. So it might not necessarily be a neutral posture, it's a re an, an, an attainable posture, but certain postures become much more challenging. And that's how I would look at it. So, so what you would see is, in general, we see this all the time, lots of people are trying to play a certain game and maybe not really great at it yet. And, and that can sometimes be where we make certain judgments. But yes, every discipline can be done in a way where the, the horses develop themselves to carry those postures um, and, and do it in a refinement. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Okay, last question, sorry. If you would want to come back to my booth, I would be happy to, go ahead. Yeah, sure. He's low. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So the question is, um, how can you help a horse when their natural posture seems to be very low? So you, you get this in certain certain horses, and it's to me sometimes. So there is neutral physical balance, but now you also have character that plays into this. Okay, so I might have a very neutral physical balance, but I'm kind of a person who's maybe a little bit more like this emotionally. So then I tend to walk around like this. <laughs> And this might not be helpful to me, but it is my mentality. Therefore, you have mind and physical presentation. So what you, tend to, what you have to do in these situations is find a balance between asking this horse to activate themselves and perk them up enough to bring the life up so that they might activate their body, but to the degree that you're not pestering them all the time. So I find that I call these horses space holders. These are the really good horses at taking care of people because they don't care too much about wasting a lot of energy doing things. Promote this in their life. Allow that to be held up. Instead of trying to draw, uh, you know that whole saying of Einstein where he says if, if everybody is compared to a monkey climbing a tree, then the fish and the whatever will look like they're not smart. Okay, so you have all these various horses. Some are really good at stuff, some are not. And to the best of our ability, it's our job to promote what they're excellent at and then help their bodies do what they can do to the best of their ability. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome, okay, great, good, good, good. And I'm gonna have to stop there, please come back to the booth. Anybody has any other questions after the demo, I'm gonna stay at the booth until we're done. Hopefully be able to visit with any one of you that would like to take some time. So thank you for spending the time with me guys.